Thank you all so much for being here, for your patience while we sorted out some of these issues. Uh, and for your patience over the course of this whole day, uh, this is the last panel of the day, so we will try and keep things light and breezy and airy for you, so yeah. just keep things moving on forward, uh, and then you can get on to the rest of your day. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. The topic that we are covering today is how are other countries handling AI? Uh, which, of course, is going to be a topic with a lot more questions than there are going to be answers, uh, as I'm sure you're familiar with by the, this point in the day and this part in the program already. Um, I am Matthew Coleman. Uh, I am, uh, I have to catch myself, a law clerk with Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe. Um, I'm a law clerk. I'm barred in uh, California and Massachusetts, but awaiting to be sworn in in New York. I moved here for love, like a silly, silly person. Um, so until July 15th, if anyone is here from the bar, uh, I am a law clerk. Um, and, uh, but I am joined today by uh, two preeminent colleagues, uh, and I will let them introduce themselves. My role here is mostly to facilitate. I'm going to be moderating this panel. Uh, but I once heard an interview with Alex Trebek where he said, essentially, my role in the game of Jeopardy is to just stand out of the way and let the magic happen. And that's gonna be my goal as well for this panel. So um, without further ado, why don't we start down uh, with uh, Ulrika, and why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're coming from, and, and what your background and your research is all about. So my name is Ulrika Thiel, nice to meet you all. I'm from uh, Cologne in Germany. I'm a lawyer with CMS there, and together with Gerlin Wiskirchen, we published a report on artificial intelligence and robotics in the workplace regarding the future of work, so for us, it's not necessarily all AI related, but the whole digital transformation that is happening. We're in employment law, and so we see a lot of changes around how the employees are actually handling artificial intelligence or the digitalization, the transformation that is happening. But also our report is mainly on the fact that Germany, as well as many other European countries especially, is uh, severely lagging behind in terms of legislation to face the upcoming challenges. Sure. Interesting. Oh. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Sam and Tori and <laughs> Alison and Rosetta. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. My name is uh, Shlomit Yaniski Raved. I'm a professor of law. I come uh, from Israel. I work in Ono Law School, which is a private institute, the largest in Israel. I have seven campuses, more than. Um, 15,000 students only in the law school. We have um, uh, 1,500 a year. Um, I also uh, teach at Fordham Law here in uh, New York from 2012, and I'm the head of the AI, uh, IP, and blockchain uh, project. I'm also the founder and the, yeah, the director of the Shalom Comparative Legal Research Center and the Liao Center for Law and Technology. And beside that, from 2011, I'm a Yale Law affiliated with the ISP, um, running projects and seminars on uh, advanced technology, which is my main research topic. Yeah, so okay. thank you for staying. <laughs> so you're both coming to, uh, to this topic from a, 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 a different perspective. Uh, Shlomit, from you as a, an IP lawyer and researcher, and then uh, Ulrika as a, a, a labor and employment attorney and looking at things from a, from a labor and employment lens um, and as well from a, a Israeli slash American perspective and, and a, a German perspective respectively. Uh, why don't we start off by talking a little bit about the research that you've both been conducting in terms of uh, this is still very early in the process for formal <coughs> rules and legislation. Uh, so why don't we talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that have been started that you're seeing around the world as it pertains to the use of AI in the workplace uh, and you know uh, the values-based principles that are being espoused in some of these regions and, and how it pertains to uh, the responsibility both of those who are developing AI technologies and those who are using them in the workplace. Yeah. So from a German point of view when I read how are the countries handling AI I took a look at the artificial intelligence strategy that Germany has, well, just recently, so to say, in 2018 published. It follows the uh, European Union strategy for artificial intelligence. And on paper, we're handling this very well, and it all is planned, and we're doing investments, and we're 
um, focusing on the next generation and on lifelong learning and we're building an ethical and moral and legal framework where it all works in. But this is, I mean, this is a strategy. We already uh, had a, a white book on, um, well, the future of work a few years ago where some suggestions were made, what should be changed in legislation just to focus or to, to be able to handle the future of work and none of these suggestions were actually then put into action in the legislation. So on paper, really well. In practice, artificial intelligence as well as, and from our perspective, artificial intelligence is a, one of the drivers for that. The digi digital transformation that is happening and the future of work that comes with that is not handled and represented very well in the legislation in Germany. So the legal framework is already a problem. When we hear about the jobs that might be affected by the implementation of robotics or automation and artificial intelligence, um, the, the numbers vary very, very, very much because some only look at um, the, well, technical feasibility of things and others take into account the social and moral and ethical and also cultural difficulties that might come with that. And for that, Germany is a is an example of a very skeptical uh, access to the whole topic because people in I think in the European Union, but even in the EU, uh, a special case of Germany, are very skeptical when it comes to the technical transformation that might be or will will happen to us, all of us, and will affect all of us. When you say transformations, can you elaborate on that? The transformations such as the change in the organization of work that less and less will be the standard employment where you have one boss, human of course, and then you work your job, you work from nine to five, you have your, your, your office or your establishment where you go to, and your job is of course, uh, your boss is employed in the same entity, and then you do your work and you go home, and that's your free time. So the future of work, as we see it, the organization, the form of work will change mainly in a way that you have less and less classical employment contracts, more uh, contingency workers, more uh, part-time workers that work for different people and way more self-employed people who then come together to, for certain projects, for example, where, be it the gig economy or in a scrum workplace or however, and that um, massively changes the way people will live and will also earn their, their money and their, well, their life, <laughs> their money to live from. Perfect. And Shlomit, yeah. I, I know you have uh, a presentation that you wanted to, to share uh, specifically on this topic. And do you want to talk about your research and, and how? Yeah, so uh, I'll be happy to. Well, once I start to uh, conduct <coughs> this research about advanced technology, I come from Israel, which is a startup nation. I'll speak about that. And now we become like the AI nation um, with the leading uh, position in the worldwide in, in innovation and uh, scientific programs and et cetera. Um, so I start thinking about AI and people start saying, because I work with uh, Israeli startups and they said it's human-like, it's creative, it's unpredictable and I couldn't get it. I, I, I guess like I was very hesitative and, and I couldn't believe there is a human-like software and what's the difference between this software to other software, the most more traditional ones, they just obey uh, kind of like orders, and and then I start working and realize, and I, I, I have scientific background, so I uh, took a pause and, and took courses in AI, together with these AI engineers that I'm working with. In Stanford, there is a wonderful course on Coursera, I think the best in the world, and um, I start uh, creating my own lab and see how it produces music, and I'll, sh I'll demonstrate some of the, of the product. And once I realize it's really human-like, so we pointed out the features, I have it in my presentation, and I start, just then I start writing, after understanding the technology, so my first, uh, I think, um, insight is in order to make, to, to think about even employ uh, at workplaces and the impact on, on work and, and workers, you have to understand how this technology works, because otherwise, I, I think, you can't really um, come to any conclusion about policy, uh, and any policy regulation. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing, because the AI softwares and as well as blockchain, where I'm um, writing about this uh, recently, uh, they are copyrightable. So you cannot just stay in, in employment and labor law uh, without looking at other f legal fields. 
So IP is really important because uh, first, uh, all these um, softwares are actually software which, which are copyrightable and patentable. And the second thing I think uh, that's uh, really um, demonstrate how creative they can be and we'll soon, I'll give you a Turing test and see if you can distinguish between works that were produced by AI versus works that were produced by human and part of them were produced in my lab. Um, and the third thing that the solution, I'm, I'm, I was focusing a lot on accountability on these malpractice of uh, AI systems. Um, so I think accountability matters, and I think it's the most important thing in this, um, I don't know, in this coming future and regulation. Um, so I think I, I try to adapt solutions from IP into employment. So I have a lot of articles. I'm writing a book, and one was um, started with uh, to read or not to read. It's about uh, when employers read. Uh, uh, data about track data about employees or future employees about applicants in um, uh, yeah, in, in website and social networks. Uh, recently, I think the the most famous one I, I, I it's in the, in your book. It's called Generating Rembrandt. We tried to uh, we thought about like reprogramming Picasso, and then we found out that Generating Rembrandt is re is an actual uh, program. So we titled that. Uh, recently, I, um, we posted. Um, <laughs> Uh, articles when AI, when AI produced patterns, and the other one um, that was just uh, accepted. I have like five um, articles in this um, three months. So one of them is from Babel Tower to Google Translate. The other one is uh, equality and privacy by design. And you can I, 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 you can understand by the titles. Uh, I think the, what's behind that. Um, and we have some more, and recently I started publishing about blockchain, which is also has a great impact on workplaces. So the patentability of blockchain, and um, <coughs> blockchain is, is the promised land or the dark side of the moon, which I adapt these expressions <laughs> also here, like the positive and, ne and the negative aspects, and blockchain and fashion design and employment, so. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of work and very interesting. So right. Do you need to uh, set up the audio yeah, demonstration? Yeah, no, I can. I can go ahead and. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. right. So uh, yeah, I have to stand because this is a, a presentation. <laughs> Grab one of the microphones. Yeah, so let me know if you, if you can hear me. Um, so maybe I'll just start with the story. Like a, a week ago when I was packing my things, actually I'm here with uh, 30 students and lawyers from, from Israel, from my college, either alumni or, uh, uh, so they're here uh, in the audience. So we're also very thankful <laughs> to, <laughs> for everyone for hosting us. It's really exciting um, conference and perfect organized. Anyway, when I packed my thing, so I went to, to a dry cleaning and I wanted to put some, um, some of my clothing to, to do some ironing. So the woman in Israel, so they asked me, uh, do you want a robot or a person? I said, what? I mean, what do you mean a robot or a person? Who wants a person? But I, I said, how much is that? And I, I assumed the robot will be much cheaper than the person. So I, I, I mean, it, it was a new Israeli shekel, so they said the robot is 10 new Israeli shekels, which is equal to more or less uh, roughly $3, and the human is uh, only 8 shekels, which is, which is $2. I thought, of course, I, I prefer the human, and it's human, and it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought, I want to see the quality of this robot. Can you have some sample of this robot? Uh, like a, I mean, a shirt that was ironed by robot, and I didn't like the quality as well. I said, no. Definitely, I'm going with the human. But then I thought, uh, what about if the, if the robot was, uh, I mean, the price of the robot was cheaper? I mean, definitely, it would influence my decision. And I thought to myself that uh, if actually this uh, lecture that you just heard about texting robot, that might be very helpful because the price matters. And uh, maybe that's why it was uh, more expensive. Or <laughs> And then I thought, maybe this woman that uh, just, you know, Spend all day and iron like eight hours a day. She just iron shirts of, of you know, people that are too lazy or have <laughs> too much money. Then they can iron themselves until mm -hmm. we we'll get the robot uh, in our houses. So um, maybe it's better that 
to go to you know to study uh, computer science instead of ironing all day and night. And but I thought, should she? I mean, can she? So it raised a lot of questions. But the, 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 uh, what I wanted to take from this example is that the, the AI softwares are already here, and I did tons of examples in my presentation. So here you can see I'm starting with the uh, with, um, uh, copyright work, but I think uh, it has, uh, like once you kind of distinguish it's something like, uh, it has to do with transparency in workplaces as well, because when you check with, with all these bot chats, we, we, we don't really know if, whether it's a bot chat or a human. Anyway, this was a, this is a painting that was made by AI and uh, like three or four months ago, uh, it was sold in an, in an auction in, you can see, $432,000. So, and it was made by AI, the software programmer was 18 years old, and I think it, it wasn't the best um, exposure to the data of this AI, because, yeah, I saw better ones. So I wanted to, um, to kind of like point out that the, our workers, our AI employers, the workers are already here, and I want to do this uh, Turing test. So you must know Turing from the imitation game, the Second World War, an enigma, and yeah, so Turing test was uh, proposed by him uh, in 1950, and it said, like, uh, once you hear uh, a conversation that's made by, uh, uh, by a machine, a computer, um, ver and, uh, uh, versus a, a, a conversation that is run by humans, but you, you, uh, it's behind a veil, so it's behind a screen, so you, you, you cannot know who is the, uh, uh, the computer and human. So can you distinguish actually between these uh, products uh, being produced by robots uh, versus uh, uh, pr other products that were produced by humans? And if you cannot distinguish, so uh, there are a lot of if so. Uh, so it means that uh, what, he, what he was saying simply is that the, the computer won. And other people like Jan Isbok try to challenge that and say, might be that the computer has the uh, consciousness and they can think and all right. So that's what we are going to do. <coughs> I'm going to play some of them. I want to basically so the options are as follows. First <laughs> like you, you all become a student here. First is that uh, I, I'm asking you which of the two uh, was produced by human. I don't ask you if it's produced by uh, a machine. Just try to guess which one of the two was produced <coughs> by human. And I need your participation because otherwise you are mm, yeah, missing the point. So I wanted to raise my hand, your hand. And uh, it can be that both of them were produced by human or both of them um, uh, could, be, could, could be a production of, uh, of a machine, of, uh, of an AI system. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with back music. This is the interactive portion of the program. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I thought, should I do that or just speak about legal issues? And, and I consulted with the organizer, and they were very much for that. So. Yeah, it's almost 5 o'clock. You guys are waiting. Okay. Display Sorry, that was a good question. It would performed. Perf no, 
the performance. Music, the, the music and the, I mean, the melody was uh, produced, the, the composed, was produced and the play as well. Mm. So both of them. So both. All right. And who thinks uh, Bach B? You yes. Can. Yeah. You're getting better, or you miss it in, <laughs> in the first place. Okay. It means you're improving. Your AI is improving, by example. Anyway, it was uh, actually Bach B. Uh, by human, I mean that was originally made by Bach, and, and the, the one who played was uh, human, and Bach A was uh, uh, the rhythm was produced as well as the, the melody itself played by uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the second one, and this is the display like two paintings. I took this painting uh, with central pit, jellyfish. And one was made by AI, not just, uh, not just that it was made by AI, I took my <coughs> students from Fordham down to the exhibition in Chelsea, that's what I love about New York, everything you can find here. And uh, so this exhibition was all, all the paintings were made by AI, but not just, because once you click the button for the AI, after you expose it to the data, you get millions of, of, of outcomes. So another AI, which is a, it's a, it's a, a special technique that uh, helps AI engineers. So another AI system was choosing uh, painting out of the million outcomes that look uh, like they're really painting and also name them. So that the name Dreyfish came from another AI. So it's just it's two AI run by someone who, uh, I don't know, presents itself as the author, but we'll think about that, is it really <laughs> an author? So we think uh, A1 is, uh, like we have A1 and, and A2. So who, who thinks AI was made by human? Okay, and A2? But I need you to raise my hand, your hand. I don't see, Moshe, what do you think? Let me. A1. A1? <laughs> All right, and we think A2? So it's randomly, but I really want you to correct. I mean, you can say I don't know. It's also an option in, the, in our group. <laughs> Okay, so it's actually uh, A2 that was uh, there in this exhibition. Okay, let's go on, comment. So who thinks B1 was made by human? And who thinks B2? You are improving. And who thinks you cannot, I mean, if, if you cannot uh, figure out, and so it's also the, the, the machine won. <laughs> All right, so it's actually B2. But now your AI starts getting the... B2 the is made by human? All right. B2, so, sorry, Shlomi. B2 was made by human? Uh, no, B2, B2 was, was the AI. made by AI, and B1 was made by human. Uh, okay, we have two more to go, and then we'll switch to AI in, uh, in workplaces. Uh, so we have uh, so D and C. So who thinks D was made by uh, human? Great, great. Now I made my turn. And who thinks D? C, sorry. No one. What is the, like the, the jury here? Like everybody influence the other? All right. So actually, they were both made by AI. And that was the motion in my quiz. And last but not least is the jazz music. And this jazz music, uh, one or, or two of them uh, were produced in my lab. And that's why I understood how it works, so that's... Like the software we use, it's a software we download from the internet for free. 
And all that it does is find pattern and similarities. And to understand how it works, it's important for policy making. So it finds pattern and similarities. And uh, then it, uh, we expose it to data, but it can track the data by, by, by itself and train. This is a judge, this is not a judge. And then it starts producing without the infringing, without copying, like it's really producing, it, it is really a creative session. So I think what we can take from that, uh, before switching to the real presentation, uh, there are two things that uh, it's really difficult to uh, distinguish between uh, works that were made by AI, uh, so it might be had um, implication on, on <coughs> transparency. Okay, let's see where is the other one. All right, so, all right, so uh, one thing is about, uh, uh, so one thing is about that we cannot really uh, distinguish and like the AI workers and AI employers are already here and because we cannot distinguish between the real and fact of transparency uh, matter, and we have to realize that it's becoming part of the game. So from here, I was, told, I was asked to speak about Israel, so I want to speak like to uh, focus on the uh, AI industry in Israel and give a lot of examples because it's uh, like an AI boom now in Israel. So give a lot of examples of startups that deal with uh, employment and workplaces. And my focus would be uh, the challenges that AI uh, face in Israel and similarly in Europe, um, like in matters of privacy and anti-discrimination law, and to speak about the possibility, which is my main uh, um, point. Um, so before we dive into accountability, I think those are all great points and considerations that are across uh, discipline and going to be issues regardless of what region you're in. Um, so Ulrika, while we're here, why don't we, why don't we uh, switch over a little bit and talk about, so in the context of the creation of an art um, in Germany, and the same thing would apply in the context of a hiring decision uh, or some other um, HR determination, how would Germany handle the attribution of an AI that could potentially be discriminatory um, or the creation of an art? You know, who would receive the benefits of the attribution or receive the potential liability relating to that decision uh, of, of an AI technology? Well, if we think of the last presentation that was made uh, regarding the recruitment tools using AI, that would be then the liability of the employer that actually uses it not necessarily the one who, the, the pr producer of the algorithm, but the employer who's actually using it and who's basing his or her decision then on that. Hopefully not automa automated decision, but on that, well, pre-selection that the uh, algorithm did for him or her. Because we have rather strict anti-discrimination laws in Germany already. And um, for example, one example would be, of course, you're not allowed to ask a woman if she's pregnant during the, um, the, during the interview. Then, of course, I mean, if we had a uh, big debate whether you can only address, in German we, we would say doctor not only as arts, but Ärztin, so we have a female form for the words as well. And that used to be a big issue when uh, only the male or only the female form Mostly, of course, the male form for art, for doctor and the female form for nurse or assistant, uh, well, that's another issue, was used. Uh, many cases of discrimination against that when a man, for example, applied for a Krankenschwester, which is the female word for nurse uh, job and would not get the job, he would then say that he or she was not addressed in the, um, uh, in the announcement and w was for that discriminated against also with the... Um, with the job offer. And if you now think that um, you base a decision, hopefully not the ultimate decision, but as well as the selection process on an algorithm that had learned from your own company or was developed for your company and has learned from other data sources, and you go then 
another step and say that every person whose personal data is used in some kind of way has the is entitled to ask for which information is used and how is it used due to the GDPR, you then have the, uh, well, the key for that person to ask which information was used and how was it used. And now I see that apparently the algorithm kicked me out because I, to use that example, um, am, am pregnant because, or not pregnant, sorry, but because I didn't go to that school or even worse, if you think about the chatbot that um, Microsoft was it used mm -hmm. um, because my company, for example, only hires people from a certain background, and I'm not from that background, or the company I'm applying to, I'm not from that background, and therefore I'm dismissed in the in the sorting process already. Not because my qualifications were not good, but just b based on that pure chance that as the data in the algorithm is well fed from the company where I'm applying to, no one from in that company is from my background. I'm from that background, I'm not getting the job because apparently I'm not, I don't fit. So the system would be unfair. So it's the company that, that would be held accountable yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. And so based on your model and based on your research, is that something that, uh, how does the world of IP account for those kinds of attributions? So I'll yeah. use the presentation? Sure. Okay, yeah. We are, uh, I know we're running somewhat short yeah, on time, so. so Um, all right, so um, I would like to speak, no, I cannot say so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to speak about like uh, Israel is a uh, nation, but I already mentioned that. So the book from 2009 pointed out that Israel is a uh, world leading, although it's in the size of New Jersey and has, uh, is, and now it's like 70 years old, 71 years old and has less than 10, 000, 10 million uh, people. So it's a world leading in uh, startups, uh, investments per capita, events, um, uh, um, scientific work, science, uh, and a lot of other innovative patents and other. And the uh, recent re report about innovation uh, from Cornell and Seattle together with Whitehall, uh, every year they, have, they publish, you can see it online, so Israel is considered like the first and leader in, uh, in, in 10 pillars. So it's really amazing because the culture in Israel is like in kindergarten, they do like startup competition and, and invention competition. So it, it really became part of the um, kind of like culture. So uh, recently, like the, the recent report of startup new startup nation, uh, revealed that there is like an AI boom and uh, AI industry is flourish, more than a thousand companies that deal with AI. All the uh, main um, you know, American firms like Google and, and Microsoft have like, uh, Facebook has research and development center, billions of dollars are, are moving to, uh, to the industry and you can see some data and I can do the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation to you can see one of the most famous is the mobile eye, like mobile eye, uh, which uh, uh, developed uh, vision for autonomous car and uh, Intel um, <coughs> recently bought it for, uh, as you can see, 15 um, billion dollars. Uh, and now they are in, based in Jerusalem, they are um, um, Developing like a new AI-based, uh, what is what they call Orcam, which is camera and light, that um, similar to the Google uh, Google glasses that helps blind and uh, really third person uh, to see. So people ask, how come such a tiny state with so many problems and uh, issues uh, develops that? So you can see part of the uh, report that say how come it will become. One of the things is the governmental support, and now we have AI Commission and Innovation Commission. Uh, we have privacy entity that goes into workplaces and say that everything is uh, except uh, for investment and education is uh, cheap in, in high quality and other factors that you can see uh, and read in, in these books and reports. So uh, when you think about uh, AI, and I want to go into this uh, accountability issue. So there are positive, I call it the promised land. So there are a lot of positive that were partly were discussed here. 
uh, like the hiring process. So uh, in my uh, article to read or not to read, uh, it's about future of fair privacy fair of employees in social network. <coughs> so I, uh, I brought a lot of uh, research and studies saying that uh, employers find the searching in uh, social networks of employees very efficient, the data is accessible, uh, the applicant doesn't know that someone is tracking his data, there is this puzzle effect that they put a lot of uh, like here and there, we are aware that uh, it's there, but someone puts the puzzle and builds something and the decision is being made without uh, the awareness of the, of the applicant. So you can see a lot, or you can read in these articles, you can SSRN uh, all my articles and, and see them. And, and so, and, and, and employer rejected the uh, uh, applicants based on uh, AI decisions and they are, they said it's more trustable and they, 90% of the, of the employers that were in the survey say that you will focus on that and they don't like the CV or traditional way to filter to screen uh, applicants just because it's inefficient. Um, are there rules in place around the use of that kind of technology? Okay. Are there rules in place in Israel? Yeah, above so that's what I'm, I'm going to. And uh, the other thing is uh, another uh, Junko, another uh, Israeli startup that tried to harness AI to, uh, into equality and, and to diminish uh, race and discrimination within workplaces. Uh, but once you have to implement it, so Israel is very similar to Europe and, and specifically Germany in this sense. So if you want to use this AI within workplaces, so all this screening, and because AI needs a lot of data to, to track, so and where does it get the data? In, in social networks and internet, and so all this tracking is considered illegal in Israel. So we have uh, a very strong privacy right. So you cannot just track uh, data of employees in, in social networks in the internet. We have uh, anti-discrimination laws, so you cannot uh, base your decision. You cannot to hire or fire like Amazon fire, uh, robots of Amazon fire people. They are tracking every movement of, or of their employees and, and they are firing. And I don't know if you see uh, some chapters of Black Mirror. So one chapter sees like the Secret chapter whereas everyone gives feedback to the other ones that the employees feed the get in, uh, in a very low, under four or under three, so the doors of workplaces are closed. So all this, because we have uh, the right to a hearing before the suicide, we don't uh, have employment in, uh, uh, at will, so uh, it wouldn't work, like the AI wouldn't work in Israel, and also it can be harmless. So um, also all this thing about biases, that data really matters, and even if you train with the right data, like you expose them to uh, employees that they are they were uh, excellent and will get this, uh, uh, out the, the certificate for being outstanding employees, but it will track the data and see uh, and become biased itself. So, uh, all right. So what I was worried, I mean, I think the main point is uh, the question of accountability. So he's responsible for biases and malpractices. And for doing that, I'll just show briefly some of the slides and then we will go back to privacy issues and anti-discrimination. I, I prepared some court, Israeli court decisions. So first, I, I, um, put, I, we made a list in our articles, generally in Rembrandt uh, and the others, of 10 features of AI real software. So, and it's a spectrum because some, it's not that all AI systems that we call them, uh, uh, naming them AI, have all, all these features. That the more they have, the more they are like, more like human-like in AI. So we, we, have, we, we spoke about creative and autonomous and unpredictable, evolving data collection, goal-oriented and so on and so forth, and we use them also in uh, workplaces. So then we ask who can, who can be the accountable? And I think when we think, we, when we, we think about employment, because of different <coughs> theoretical justification to employment law, it might be different than IP. So the first thing that we totally deny is uh, giving the rights and, uh, and duties to the AI itself, to the robot itself. It might work in other uh, fields of law, but it doesn't work, I think, in employment. Uh, it might work in, in IP, but, uh, uh, but just to, um, to give you some of the scholars who write about that, so they're based on the firm uh, theory, they say the firm itself is not human, 
but they still have duties and, and rights. And also on the, the personality theory, they think what, what is like what is the person and what is the consciousness? It's just like electronic signals within your mind. So that's what like in, in this uh, definition of consciousness. So it means the machine has consciousness. Like to like someone, you just like uh, yeah, to like some part in your brain. So who can it be? Yeah, I'll do it very short. It could be who can be accountable. It could be the software programmer. It can be the trainer because the data is much more important than the software itself. You just find pattern similarities. It can be the owner of the hardware, the manufacturer, or the operator. So uh, what? I mean, two more slides and, and about accountability. So the first thing is to understand that the software programmer is not the one to be accountable for uh, the practice of uh, uh, AI system. And that's because it's unpredictable and it's uh, black box and because it keeps on evolving. And finding pattern similarities, you can use it for many things. So the, the data measures, but the data provider is not the one to hold accountable. Uh, we cannot also reach to this IP uh, solution that to say no one, like the monkey selfies, you know, the story about the monkey that took his selfie and the uh, copyright, I mean, court, because at the end of the day, <laughs> an NGO for animals sued uh, the, yeah, the photographer and claimed that the, uh, the monkey has the right, and they said no one. So what we suggest is, uh, although I don't like because I see uh, AI in the way of human life, is go after either that really seek that search for the, the person behind the, uh, the machine and in other uh, jurisdictions, they said the one who made the arrangement. And I think what we suggest is a solution uh, that is adapted from uh, um, um, IT at workplaces, like when you have an employee who uh, works and uh, or an agent <laughs> that uh, creates uh, works of art, so the right go to uh, to the employer and the accountable uh, the, 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 the employer is accountable and is the right holder. So uh, in that way, we thought to uh, to suggest and this our suggestion. Uh, that was uh, discussed by Israeli labor uh, national law, labor law court judge, and they agreed to that. That uh, uh, a robot of Amazon uh, fire uh, employees, it, the employer will be accountable because of this uh, AI work made for hire uh, doctrine. And I think that's to do that, that the beneficiary should also take the accountability. So once we have the, decided that the employer is accountable. Uh, so he's the one who should uh, uh, pay the, the police, the insurance, and he's the one, the one to, to use uh, uh, the AI for making decisions within workplaces, but with, uh, yeah, uh, with, with the careful yeah, standard. And, and, and actually, our take on that, that uh, it's good that he's using AI, and, uh, but he should be careful and accountable for that. And, and I would just end up with saying that uh, if, you, if you ask me for um, AI in workplaces, so I would say I'm not curious. I think uh, workplaces are like hospitals in a way. And if you go to a doctor and you want him to, uh, to give you some predictions about your uh, medical condition, so you wouldn't like him to rely only on his expression because people are biased and they cannot process a lot of information. So you want him to rely so on, on uh, AI or electronic devices. So once uh, you have uh, an AI system uh, which can filter applicants, and so I think this should be a combination between human and the AI, and it, will, it should be uh, considered as negligence if the human resource, if workplaces wouldn't use AI once it's there, and if there is a gap in, uh, in decisions, so someone has to explain why they come to a different 
conclusion. It's an interesting point. Uh, so Shlomit has actually written a, a very yeah. well-researched and very well-articulated article on that that's included in part of your presentation materials for uh, the day today. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. But one thing I did want to mention is that uh, you're starting to see countries put together these values-based principles for the governance of AI. Um, you know, I, I know a number of the EU member states have put together their own. The EU Commission has put together their own. And a lot of them are largely the same, as you would expect. And what I would recommend doing, if you're interested, take a look at the OECD guidelines. Uh, the OECD, in I think we believe it was May 25th of this year, issued a set of values-based principles, both for the operators and users of AI, as well as for policymakers at the federal, uh, federal or regional level. Um, and they really well articulate, again, just broad-based principles that could be used for regulating AI, promoting the use of AI, promoting the development of AI, sharing of data, uh, open and clean data, and essentially building public trust around the use of AI, which is readily applicable to this HR context that we're talking about. Um, so again, I apologize, we have run out of time, but uh, I want to thank my co-panelists. And if there are any questions, by all means, please come up to the microphones, um, and uh, we will try and address them as quickly as we can. No questions? Thank you so much. And I know uh, one of our uh, esteemed coordinators, Tori, wanted to come and say a few words before you all depart for the afternoon. Uh, sorry to keep you just a few more seconds, but um, for thank you to the panel and the presenters. Tomorrow morning we have breakfast again at 8.15 and the program starts at uh, 8.45 and ends about 3.30 after the Ethics and Professional Responsibility panel. And we do have um, evaluation review forms outside and there's also a link to them on Google Forms which I will send to all of the uh, attendees. So thank you very much. Thank you all again.